So um, again, we want to thank thank the guys that are here for the first time. I know I have some of my life group guys here, um, and it's a blessing to have my brother uh, Derek here. I asked him if he could help me to uh, record this lesson because we know there's a lot of guys that are not here today. Um, they're uh, they're in the encounter, and so we have uh, from just the valley. Ruben was telling me. Just from this area, we have about 30 guys up in the encounter. Wow. And so, plus the other people that are from uh, Culver City area, uh, from uh, Pastor uh, Rudy Haygood, and our brother and Pastor Oscar Corral. They're up there in the mountains. We have TJ, we have Darcy, we have Henry, and I don't know who else is up there um, uh, at the mountain top. And if you've been to an encounter, you know what's going on. And if you don't, man, we, uh, we want you to go, man, because that's how the brew line started. They went to an encounter, and then when they came back, they wanted to hold each other accountable. And a long story. Just keep coming. You hear how the story went. But look at us here. What is it, 14 years now? 13, 14 years strong? 14 and a half. So, um, and also, um, I would like to thank and give a shout out to people that, um, our, uh, my brother in Christ, my Puerto Rican brother, Ariel, he's in Florida. He's like, bro, I can't wait to see you. And unfortunately, we're not going live, but shout out to him. And again, thanks to my brother. We're going to uh, upload it on the Brewline uh, YouTube channel later on. Also to a lot of brothers and sisters out in Houston, where my daughter lives. They're, they wanted to also tap in, but... Those get to see it later, so blessings to uh, City of Refuge Church. Um, they're so wonderful for, to my daughter out there in Houston. And then I also have people in Long Beach that wanted to tap in. And uh, they couldn't be here, but God's willing, they'll, they'll check. So having said all of that, man, would you guys please uh, bow your heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious God, we come to your presence right now knowing that it is not a coincidence that we're here today. Lord God, you have a divine appointment for each and every one of us here. We ask, Lord God, that you would please renew our minds, that we could have the ears to hear what you have to say to us today. And most of all, Lord God, that our spirit will be filled with your joy, with your grace, with your mercy. And we have a special prayer, Lord God, for the men that are up there in the encounter. We know that you're doing wonderful things in their lives. And we ask that they will continue seeking you when they come down from that hill. Be with the ones that are there to serve. We know that that um, is a task that um, takes the heart. And every man that's up there is doing it from the heart. Uh, we praise you, God. We love you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And if you agree with me, would you please say amen. 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 So, um, I don't know if you have anything to take notes with. Um, I'm going to be saying quite a bit of scriptures. So again, that's why I'm glad that it's recorded. You can tap back on it later and go through those scriptures a little slower. So I'm, a lot of times what I do when I am in a position like that, I just pay attention. And then later, you know, I get all the scriptures. And if I'm here, man, if you need some scriptures, we can talk later and I could give you uh, whatever questions you have. So um, today, uh, great. Today we want to talk about the armor of God. But before we even get there, before we even get there, I want to, I want to share with you guys some very um, important stuff, so the, the important word. Um, the book of Ephesians is divided very neatly in two sections. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are doctrinal. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are doctrinal. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 are practical. So let's start in uh, chapter 4, Ephesians. Please go to the book of Ephesians. Chapter 4. If you have it, say amen. All right. Ephesians chapter 4. And if you don't just listen, well... I'll read it to you. And by the way, I'm using the New King James Version. 
I heard you're right around there somewhere. <laughs> it says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with, with which you were called. If you study the Bible, you know that whenever you get to the word therefore, you got to stop and understand why is it therefore. So it's therefore because here Paul is telling us therefore, meaning chapters 1, 2, and 3. Because of chapters 1, 2, and 3, therefore, it says walk worthy. I'm going to give you a quick glance at chapters 1, 2, and 3. In chapters, uh, in chapter one, we read that we are adopted. We read that we are elected. We read that we are redeemed. We read that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And this is my point here. It says in chapter uh, one, verse 13, and made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places. So, we're sitting together with Christ in heavenly places. So we have it twisted, man. We think we gotta walk, 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 and then finally we get to sit with the Lord. Here we understand, we sit with the Lord, and He's already done all of this. Therefore, we should walk worthy. And, and, and we need to understand that. Oh, you know, where am I sitting? Jesus has paid all of that already. So going on, I'm gonna read to you uh, to finish this up, chapter 2, verses 4 through 6 of Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. The Word of God says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, verse 6. And hath graced us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, we don't need to do anything to just to get God's favor or to marry his love. In uh, 1 John 4.19 we read, we love him because he first loved us. And that scripture came to me alive, man. When, when my daughters were born. Because even before they had taken that first breath, dude, I was loving on her. I was loving on them. I didn't know what I was gonna have before a girl, but I knew that I was loving them. So it's easy for them to love me because even before they were born, I loved them. So the Lord loved us when we were sinners, okay? So therefore, walk worthy. Now, Chapters 4, 5, and 6, it's also broken up into sections. And it talks about walking in four different ways. The first one, it says to walk in unity. We also are to walk in purity. We also are to walk in harmony. And what we're going to look at today is to walk in victory. I'm going to give you some scriptures just so people would know. Um, unity is chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Purity picks up in chapter 4, 17 to chapter 5, verse 21. And harmony picks up in chapter 5, 22 to chapter 6, verse 9. Let me pause right there because in the part of harmony, it's also broken down. And this harmony talks about walking in harmony, harmony between husbands and wives. It also talks about walking in harmony between children and parents. And it talks about walking in harmony between slaves and masters, or we would say employers and employees. And then the last section, finally, to walk in victory. So, let me read to you guys from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 24, and then we'll break those verses down. The Word of God says, Ephesians 6, 10 through 24, 
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and in having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand. Verse 14, stand therefore having girt, girt your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18, Praying always with all prayers and supplications in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. All right, you guys ready? Let's tackle this verse by verse. First one, be strong in the Lord. When I was, uh, I want to share with you guys, this took me to the story of Joshua. If you guys remember, Joshua uh, came after Moses. And the scripture, Joshua chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, uh, it says this. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I jumped. In chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 9, the Lord tells Joshua, be strong. He tells him to be strong and courageous. All right, that's how we got to start. But the unique thing about this too is, and that's what the scripture I want to read to you, and I'll explain it. Joshua 1, 16 through 18. So they answered Joshua saying, all that you command us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Verse 17. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you. <clears throat> As he was with Moses, verse eighteen. Whoever rebels against you command or against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. What this means, guys, is that we need to be strong not just for ourselves. See, here he had a whole multitude of people saying, "We're with you. We're with you." And guess what? If you're married first person that should be there with you is your wife, your kids. So you need to be strong not just for yourselves. You need to be strong for if you're involved at church, in a ministry. You need to be strong at work because they're going to see who you are and how you act. So we need to be strong. That's the first thing that we see. Next, it says, verse um, 11, put on the whole or full armor of God. That simply to me implies that <clears throat> at times we could lack and not put it all on. Right? Simple. You gotta put it all on. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles, the strategies, the deceits, the lies, the schemes. And so um, a long time ago, a long time ago, I was still able to play basketball in the gym in a, in a uh, uh, what do you call it, in a league. And uh, I remember 99.9 of the times my opponent was better than me. So what I would do is I would get in their heads and I would try to guard them, but I would tell them, oh, that's cute. Oh, that's cute. And they behind them back, oh, my sister does that, that's cute. And they would get on their heads, man. And they're just like, oh, you know, they get all mad. But I was using that little scheme. I was using that, you know, just to get on their heads. <clears throat> I brought a friend today. He's <clears throat> been in my house for a very long time. <laughs> uh, 
How many of you guys think this is cute? I think it's cute. You think this is cute? Guess what? The adversary, he sees a lot of this go to church on Sunday. They see a lot of these go to church on Sunday. Cute, man. Cute. Life is not a playground. Life is a battleground. So when he sees this, he says, yeah, that's right. He's doing his part. So today, I want us to look at this in a different eyes, man. The armor of God. This is not a joke. And we're going to read some stuff right now that is deep. You guys ready? So it says, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Guys, we have a battle. We're going to break this down. First one, verse 12, talks about principalities. Principalities is territories, regions of the world, civilizations, and cultures. There's a really nice scripture in the book of Daniel. If I write this down, Daniel chapter 10, 1 through 14. Daniel chapter 10, 1 through 14. I'm only going to read verse 13. It says, But the prince of the king of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. So here we can understand that there was a battle going on in the spiritual realms. The prince of Persia tried to interfere with God's angel that had a delivery for Daniel. So some scholars say that it could be, that could have been uh, the angel Gabriel. We do read here that it says that Michael came and helped. So there are, this is what I understand. This is in a house of scripture to share with you guys right now. There are three heavens. There are three heavens. The first one is the one we live in. The second one is the atmosphere. And the third one is the heaven of heavens where the Lord, where God lives. And write this down. Paul or as a matter of fact, let me put this back down. I want to read this. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 2. Let me read this real quick for you guys. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. The Word of God says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was cut up to the third heaven where it was in the body or out of the body I don't know God knows and this is funny Paul is talking about the third person because it's him he's the one that was cut up to the third heaven so then I started looking up what third heaven so these are the scriptures that and there's more but I'm only going to give you a couple the first heaven, the atmosphere. You can find a reference in Genesis chapter 6, verse 7. The atmosphere. You could also find it in the book of James chapter 5, verse 18. That's the atmosphere. A reference to the celestial where the sun, the moon, and the stars. You can find a reference in Matthew 24, chapter 24, verse 29. And the heaven of heavens, you can find that reference in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. So, here we see the principalities, demonic beings, in, 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 you know, in the heavens, interfering with the messaging from God. So that's one, principalities. Two, powers. This power speaks of the demonic forces that keep people in bondage. The powers that keep people in bondage. Um, 
One thing I want to make clear is that if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you cannot have a demon in you. You cannot be possessed or be powered by somebody because you have the Holy Spirit. So if you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, man, that's free. That's free. Now, I'm going to throw this one at you. And I hope if you have any questions, come and see me later. Okay? So why, if we give ourselves to the Lord, why do we still have struggles? You're telling me I'm not, I'm not in bondage by these demons? Then why is it that I'm still struggling, man? Why? Well, easy one. We're still in the flesh. We're still in the flesh. And that's going to be a battle. Remember, Paul says that what I want to do, I don't do. What I end up doing, the things that I already confused myself. <laughs> the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, that I end up doing. But here, this is something that I learned a long time ago. And it kind of gave me courage to keep going. Now, remember when Joshua went into the promised land? He went to the promised land. And uh, I hear preachers say that the promised land is heaven. Oh, you know, you go through all of this and finally you get to the promised land. Then my question is, okay, so if I take that, why are there giants in heaven? If that's the way you put it. You guys with me? I hope I don't lose you. So if Joshua and the people went into the promised land, and remember who's uh, Caleb was the one that said, hey, give me the hardest place where there's still big giants. I'll go take on on them. So my point in that is, even though I'm still here and I accepted the Lord and I want to be a good Christian, I'm still going to fight giants. The Holy Spirit has been given to me. And, and I take that as the promised land. But I still have to fight giants. So I hope I didn't throw a curve at you. If I did, <clears throat> go find your pastor and go ask him. <laughs> what did this guy say? Now you can come to me. But I hope it's clear. We still got to fight giants, guys. All right. <clears throat> the other one is rulers of the darkness of this age. Demonic forces that oversee leaders, any given society, any people in authority. And I, you know, I don't even have to go into too much detail on this because all I got to say is demonic beings and the educational system, what we read, and the governments. And I'm just not talking the United States government. I'm talking all the governments. Um, you know, I'm from Guatemala and, uh, you know, El Salvador, all these other countries, third world countries, there's so much stuff going on. Um, in the entertainment world, demonic forces that are uh, uh, there, um, people in charge of the, oh, how about now, social media. That's, that's new, uh, like at least a decade, right, old? So rulers of darkness of this age, or in your, your Bible might say this world. Let me go on to the other one. Spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. This one here, we're not talking about straight out evil worship or devil worship or santeria. This is not what this is talking about. This is talking about things in heavenly places. Some things that, you, that would make people think, oh, this is godly. Oh, this is good. I'll give you one real simple, simple example, and then I'll give you another one that's really deep. I grew up in the city of Bell. A block away from me is the city of Huntington Park. And there was a time where people were going to this one house because the reflection of the sun, there was an image of the Virgin Mary. And you know, people that are vulnerable and they love the Virgin Mary, and they, they fall for this stuff, you know? And, and I went to see it with my friend and I couldn't see it, but some people saw it and they claim they see it, you know? That's something simple, just images and stuff. Um, I read about a lady, her name is uh, Teresa de Avila, or Teresa of Avila. She's a nun from the 1500s who made, started her own convent, and she talked about uh, body experiences and all this other stuff. Um, 
I won't go too deep on this one, but there's a guy by the last name of Smith that he had a vision and he saw an angel. You guys, if you guys don't know about that, as somebody. So that's that's straight. Now let me let me read this to you right here. Oh, you might go to it too. Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verses thirteen through fifteen. This is gonna just seal what I'm just saying. The word of God says, Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verses thirteen through fifteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. Verse 15. Therefore, it is no great thing of his ministers also to transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to the word. Let me not even go into some churches that maybe you've been to where the pastor's just whack. The pastor's just thinking that this is my domain and we do what we do because I say so. Jeez, that verse right there comes to mind. Okay, let's go on. So, you know, I was reading and I always thought, and I always knew, <clears throat> I thought I knew, that the Bible says that one third of the angels were kicked out of heaven. Have you guys heard that before? Do you know that there's no scripture saying one third? Exactly. That's the only reference we have in Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, where it talks about the dragon knocking down one third of the stars. But if that's true, just think about it. Who's a mathematician here? I'm not. Brother, you are? Let's say there were a million, a million angels. Let's just say there were a million angels, so just for the sake of doing these numbers. What's one third of a million? Three, 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 point three, 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 three. That's a lot of angels. Where are they at? Where are they at? They're all scattered around everywhere. Just, uh, just think about that. So, is that alarming? Yeah. Is that uh, to put us in fear? No. Because we walk in victory. We know where we sit. We know who's won. So now we got now we come into the armor of God. And I have 10 minutes. So let's do this quickly. So it says, having girded your waist, your belt, your loins with truth. Now notice it doesn't start with the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top. It starts in the middle. Why? Because that's where your personals are at. That's where your private is at. And Blinky's not here. I wanted him to, to, to do a little boxing moves. He's a champion in boxing. Can you imagine going to fight with your shorts falling? It just doesn't make sense, right? You're in the ring and your boxers just keep falling. It doesn't make any sense. Picture that. So we need to put on the belt of truth. That's where we start. The belt of truth. So, um, let's go on. Verse 14 still. The breastplate of righteousness. Simple answer. And we were talking about this in my life group the other day with Alonso here. The simple answer. Just do what's right. Just do what's right. Okay? Long answer. A lot of people have sad hearts. Hard hearts. Or broken hearts. Because they failed to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And I give you an example. They tell the young man, she's no good for you, man. Oh, no, no, no. Just do what's right. Red flags are going everywhere. Do what's right. She's no good for you. They tell her, he's not good for you. <clears throat> he's not good for you. And she's like, no, no, but I'll convert him. No, we're not in that ministry. <laughs> so... Just do what's right. Just do what's right. And so, if you don't put it on, then eventually your own heart is going to start condemning you. And in Revelations, we read that the devil condemns us day and night. 
So if you don't have the breastplate of righteousness, man, this is what you're going to have to go through. But once you realize and you say, wait, um, I can't be forgiven. I can't do this. And you put on that breastplate of righteousness, then you realize that it convicts you now. It doesn't condemn you. It goes from a conviction to, um, I mean, from a condemnation to a conviction. Because conviction draws you near to God. Right? Conviction drives you near. Condemnation drives you away. So, going on. Shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And some, some uh, translation says fitted. And that, that's amazing to me because what I get is my shoes are fitted for me. I can't use anybody else's shoes. Their shoes are for me. Fitted for me. And I must be ready. I must be ready. Now, one of the things here that really popped to my, to my head, I had to look it up, is Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims his peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation. Who says to Zion, you, your God reigns. So how beautiful are the feet of those who take the gospel. But if you forget to put on the breastplate, guess what happens? It gets to our heads. We're fitted, we're ready. And now guess what happens in the church? Unfortunately, we see this. They start stomping on people. They start stomping on people for not doing what's right or for not knowing the word. So you got to be careful. It says here, Shod your feet with readiness, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Don't use that to start hurting people, start throwing, oh, you're no good, you're going to hell. No, peace, gladness. Going on, the shield of faith. It says, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. It says, above all, it doesn't mean most importantly, better than the, the shield, better than, no. It says, above all, literally. And I think, brother, can you um, put the Caesar, the, the one with the, this is what it means, above all. So you, you need, you know, you come to the brew line and you ask for help, you cover yourself. And if you've been a brew liner for at least a month, you gotta know this scripture. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And guys, um, you need, if you're in that situation where the fiery darts come, and by the way, right, if they throw a dart at you or an arrow, it's not from here, it's from far. So it's gonna come. And it's going to get you from above. So protect yourself. I say Monday, we have no men left behind. Right? Monday nights. Tuesdays, we have something going on. I know Wednesdays, I have a Bible study if you guys want to come. Thursdays, we have a shepherd. Now we have a service on, on Thursdays. Fridays, I'm sure we have something going on. Saturday, Sunday. Dude, go somewhere and get protected. Get, 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 get with the brothers. Get with the people that are going after uh, a pure heart. All right, going on. The helmet of salvation. Now, again, I first thought, oh, yeah, the things that go in my mind, the things that I see. But the key word here is salvation. So how do I deal with that? Well, looking it up, it means that we have constantly in our thought the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once you put that helmet on and you think, oh, today is the day that the Lord is coming, you're going to live differently. If you, if I, if we constantly believe in our Lord coming today, we will live differently and with the anticipation of His coming, we will live in purity. So, 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of hope of salvation. So that's what that means, the helmet of salvation. Verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 
<laughs> I do not know Greek. I barely can speak in English and Spanish. But here, when you study, the word is not logos. It's the word rema. So it says here, even though, you know, in the other picture we have the big sword, we always think it's the big sword. But if you read it, it says the rema word. What does that mean? The rema word is something specifically. It's almost like a dagger when you do hand-to-hand -hand combat. So it says to be prepared with the sword. So, yes, we need the word. This is the word. This is, this is uh, Hebrews 4.12 right here, right? That it says, for the word of God is a living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of the soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. This is Lagos. What it's talking about here is Rema, the spoken word. So we, you know, if you're going through, through something specifically, then you have a word specifically for that person, for that situation. Um, one example that we have is when Jesus was tempted and he had the Rema word, where he specifically quoted Deuteronomy. And we find that all in, in, in Matthew when he, uh, where he's tempted. Now, let me uh, wrap it all together here. Uh, as one brother said, let, let's land the plane. <clears throat> so, do we literally, every morning, put on the belt, put on the breastplate, put on the shoes? Do we do that literally? Can we do that literally? Maybe. But that's going to be, I'll give you a week. If that, you know, we get up, oh, we got to go to work, we got to do this, we got to do that. One of the things that I shared with you guys in the past, <clears throat> I would say if my wife was here, she could, she could uh, tell you this is true. When I wake up, my hands go up. I'm still in bed and my hands go up. And I say the Lord's Prayer. And you guys heard me say this before. I say the Lord's Prayer before I get out of bed. So to me, I'm putting the Lord, I'm putting Jesus in my life. And remember that the Lord's Prayer covers everything. Covers you, covers your loved ones, covers everything. So please memorize the Lord's Prayer. And I, and I encourage you, man, say it before you get out of bed, say it before you get out of your house. Okay? <clears throat> I'm going to go through this real quick. Jesus is the belt of truth. John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to tell you Jesus is the whole armor of God. He is our breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness. Romans 13, verse, chapter 13, verse 14. Close yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. He guides our feet in peace. Luke 7, 1, 79 says to guide our feet into the path of peace. Jesus is our shield. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The, the, the shield of faith. He is our captain of our salvation. Hebrews 2, 10 says to make the captain of their salvation. Jesus is our captain. He is the sword. John 1, verse 14 says, so the word became human and made himself among and made his home among us. All this armor, guys, is Jesus. Let me close with this scripture. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 22. Putting it all together. <clears throat> the word of God says, verse 18, I ask that your minds may be open to see his light so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you. How rich are the wonderful blessings he promises people. Verse 19. And how very great is his power at work in, in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength. Verse 20. Which he used when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right side in the heavenly world. Verse 21. Christ. Rules there above all heavenly rules, above all authorities, above all powers, 
and about all lords. He has the title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. Verse 22, God puts all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as a supreme Lord over all things. Verse 23, the church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things in everywhere. By the way, that's the good news translation. Guys, Jesus is the armor of God. And so today, I want to ask you, <clears throat> will you make the commitment on putting on the whole armor of God every day and stop being a time card Christian? Brother, do you have the time out? Oh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Man, I've been saying this for a long time. At least 10 years. Man, I'm tired of time card Christians. I'm tired of time card pastors. You know, just, and, and, and so my wife is like, well, I told her, would you go with me to go buy some time cards? Because I want to share this with the group. And so what I want to ask you today, there's a section in the bottom and this is what I wrote. And you guys can write it on your own time. You can write it in your own words. But I wrote, today I make the commitment of being a full-time Christian. And I signed it. And right now, I'm going to put the time. What time is it? 9.05. So on Saturday, where it says in, I'm going to put 0, 9, 0, 5. And I'm going to make this line because I'm making a commitment in front of my brothers that I'm going to not clock out. I clocked in. I'm not going to clock out. So I encourage you guys to please do something like that. Put it in your Bible so you can be reminded by um, a magnet strong enough to hold this. Put it in your refrigerator. But guys, would you make that commitment today? Would you make a commitment to them being a full-time Christian? And if you do, be bold. And would you stand with me? If you want to make that commitment, would you stand up? I'm, I'm throwing it at you. That's how we do it here at the pool. Are you ready to make that commitment of being a full-time Christian? I believe everybody here is a, a born-again Christian. <clears throat> If you're born again, raise your hand. If you're born again, Christian. See, that way I don't put the guy that are not in, in, a, in a spot. <laughs> we always do an altar call. If you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ here at the Brew Line, you have that opportunity. But it seems to me like everybody here already accepted the Lord. So let me just pray out, guys. And um, I'll give it back to Brother Ruben. Let's pray. Precious God, we thank you for this day that you uh, allow us to be here at the Brew Line. We know that there are no coincidences. Uh, when a man walks under grace, there is no such thing as luck. And so today, Lord God, it was a divine appointment for us to be here. I pray that um, your word penetrated our hearts, that uh, my brothers here will understand what you had in mind for them this morning, and that we could understand that we sit in a heavenly place with the Lord and, and Savior Jesus Christ, and therefore we get to walk and, 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 and just enjoy our walk with you. We know that we're going to have battles in front of us. We know that we're going to have giants. But Lord God, you tell us that we have been adopted, that you tell us that we've been elected since before the foundation of the world. We have been redeemed by the blood of, the, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And look at so <clears throat> we thank you for this morning. Let us understand that and walk in purity, in harmony, and Lord God, in victory. You're an awesome God. <clears throat> we love you and praise you and thank you for this day. If you agree with me, please say amen. Amen, amen. amen guys. Thank you.